Thank you very much, uh, Tony. It's a privilege to be part of, of this session, especially seeing that it's the first time that the College of Law is participating. Uh, I feel really honored uh, for it. I'm going to stop my video and speak to the um, to the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Yes, as you can see uh, of, of my name and the department that I uh, am from, uh, School of Criminal Justice in the College of Law. It's a big privilege for me to be here and I would like to welcome everyone that is attending in person and those who are going to view the presentation later uh, to this presentation. Uh, I must be honest, I thought and I think I'm right that everyone that will be uh, a party to this uh, discussion uh, already has got at least an honours degree and some of you have got a master's degree. And I was in planning this presentation, I was thinking I'm not going to do the basics what methodology 101 that you've already learned uh, in undergraduate, in honours level and most probably in master's level. Uh, all of you are aware of the research processes and so forth. What I decided is that I'm going to share with you some uh, uh, contentious issues that, that uh, uh, arise from my experience. As you've heard, I've got a very, very wide experience over many years uh, in supervising students and also being on the uh, uh, Ethical Clearance Committee of, of CLAW, uh, I read many, many proposals. And there are a couple of common things that I thought that I would like to bring to your attention. There are five aspects that I would like for you to take away from this session. Um, so this is a brief overview of what you can expect um, in, in this discussion. I'm also going to be very practical. I'm going to give you examples and applications from my um, uh, experience as well as from others uh, of my colleagues experiences so that this doesn't become an academic lecture per se, but more uh, uh, applied uh, uh, in, in depth look at contentious issues in postgraduate research. I'm first going to look at you with, I'll look with you at the world view of the study. Now, what is the world view of the study? It's a framework that directs all the elements of the research process. There are a couple of slides that will cover that, so I trust that you will uh, be able to get uh, gain a better understanding of what I mean by world view of the study. Then I would like to speak about the transformative lens that is so important, uh, especially in a country like South Africa. Uh, where we are sitting with vulnerable groups, we are often researching uh, 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 vulnerable and uh, groups that need a slightly different approach than what your regular uh, style of research would ask for. A uh, lot about that later on. <clears throat> uh, why why transformative uh, the transformative lens is so important is because it allows for good rapport between the interviewer or the researcher and the participant or the respondent, uh, it will yield a depth of data. And I'll explain to you that later on what, what I mean by that. And it will eventually result in trustworthy, valid and reliable research. Now, one aspect, the third aspect that I really find intriguing is the issue of terminology. I believe that everything has got a name. You cannot call a knife a fork and a fork spoon. A knife is a knife and a fork is a fork. And that's the, the, there's no argument about that. And I find that very often students mix up terminology. And it's not just me that find that I've got a, a whole list of sources uh, which uh, substantiate this specific point. So I would like to also talk about terminology. One of my colleagues uh, teased me the other day and said, uh, you always say you must speak methodology when you talk about research. Now, I regard that as a huge compliment because we must use the, the terms, the language of methodology and name the concepts correctly. Then the fourth aspect is something that's very close to my heart, and that's research ethics. Uh, and I'm going to put a slightly different spin on research ethics. Perhaps you may already 
be aware of the depth that research ethics go into. Now, for me, that is a golden thread of the research project. It's not just that little line to say uh, there's an informed consent form and there will be the participants will be held anonymous and uh, the study will be voluntary. That is not what I'm talking about. That's a small part of what research ethics is all about. And then an aspect that specifically for uh, uh, qualitative researchers is a concept of bracketing. Uh, it's got also a French name that's very often used. It's called EPOCH, E-P-O-C-H-E. I guess I pronounced it incorrect. I cannot speak French, but bracketing is uh, with a statement to indicate what you as a researcher brings to the study. OK, let's start with the discussion. Uh, there are basically four worldviews in research, in, in the social science research. Uh, we in the uh, uh, School of Criminal Justice use a different methodology than what the, uh, the uh, researchers in the School of Law use. Uh, they've got much more a legalistic approach. They work very seldom with uh, with persons itself, whereas in the School of Criminal Justice, we mainly uh, work with people. Our, uh, our uh, research strategy is that of engaging with persons in, in whatever different different ways. So what we have, the first one is a post positive positivist that refers to also known as a, a quantitative research. That is where uh, the researcher engages in theory testing and it looks at factors that cause certain behavior uh, the and it's through numerical measurement. And the analysis method is this, uh, the statistical package for the social sciences. I'll also speak about that a bit later on. Then there is the interprovist. The, the other three that are following are uh, all three uh, qualitative uh, approaches. The interpretivist. This means to make sense of the meanings that participants attach to particular life experience. Uh, and uh, thematic analysis is a way to analyze that. I'm going to give you the example of interpretivist and we'll go into more detail uh, on the research that uh, I was part in conducting. Uh, that was on finding out how police officials experience, what meaning did they make about the, the implementation of the protocols, the COVID-19 protocols during the lockdown period. Um, because it was completely, they were completely out of their depth. So meaning making. Then the third one is that of pragmatic. That is actually the most often used because it starts with a problem, a specific problem that one is, uh, has identified and looking for a solution. In other words, you identify, uh, um, uh, let's say, housebreaking in a specific area uh, is becoming a huge problem. Now, what can we do to resolve it? That's pragmatic, also thematic analysis. There are also other forms of qualitative analysis, uh, analysis but this, the thematic is the, the most common one that's used. And then the fourth one is very important, and that is the advocacy. Uh, the advocacy worldview focus on critical issues of marginalized and vulnerable persons. For example, uh, much research is needed on uh, uh, gender-based violence. You know, uh, President Ramaphosa said that, and I fully agree with him, that uh, GBV is actually the pandemic that we are experiencing in South Africa. And we only know about a few of, of those that are actually brave enough to go and report and am in a position and is still alive to be able to go and report that. Femicide is a huge problem in, in South Africa. The aim of advocacy is to bring change, uh, to bring uh, solutions to problems for vulnerable persons. For example, research that will be done on um, refugees, uh, the Zamazamas, they are all vulnerable persons, and that would be the advocacy approach. Now, I'm using these four, these names for these four worldviews. But I would like to get back to my comment earlier on that we must speak method, the language of methodology. Now, different prominent uh, methodologists, for example, Cresswell, 
will call. Um, I'm actually following Chris Wall's uh, approach. I'm a huge fan of his. Um, he uses these terms, but then uh, Lincoln and Gooba, for example, name these different. Uh, and that's fine, but you must just remember that when you are going to uh, uh, word your, your methodolo methodological lens, that you must say, from whose perspective am I going to present it? So if you decide I'm going to use uh, Criswell, then throughout your methodology, you must use the terminology that Criswell uses. You cannot use Criswell's uh, terminology and then you go and use uh, Lincoln and Gubas, for example. Uh, so consistency in many aspects in a research is of, of paramount importance. Now, when I say method methodological lens, you will see what I mean by that when you look at the next slide. Why is the worldview so important? The, the worldview is the mindset that affects the actions that will be taken during the research process. You can say, you can equate it to, and I'm going to give a, a silly example here, you uh, put on uh, dark lenses, uh, 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 glasses that's tinted, uh, let's say, green, and the whole world looks green to you. Or you put on different glasses that makes the world look red, and the whole world looks red to you because you look through red lenses or through green lenses. Uh, and uh, but, but back to this, uh, the way the worldview that you will adopt is the way in which you will look and view the whole methodology research process. It's a matter of logic and not of methodology. I'm going to unpack the word methodology to you a little bit later because of the different ways of constructing and engaging with ev evidence. You can see that you will engage differently in the um, a constructivist uh, worldview when you interview police officials to get their meaning making of policing during the uh, lockdown uh, protocols as what you would when you interview uh, a, a victim of GBV. You, you, it, it, it will look completely different uh, because of the lens that you are putting on the what for the one you've got an, uh, uh, an, an and at advocacy worldview, and for the other one, you've got a constructivist worldview. The effect of the worldview on research is profound because it determines the ontology. You'll have to familiarize yourself with these terms, ontology, epistemology, and so forth. But in this instance, the ontology is what can we know we talk about observational reality and we talk about subjective rea reality. Observational reality will be one plus one is two. Or I see a tree with uh, a chair and tables, uh, a table and chairs underneath it. That's the observational reality. The subjective reality will be, if you take one worldview, it will be a set of facts. But for the other, it will be, for, for example, the advocacy. It will be uh, the place where the victim was assaulted by the husband, for example. So you can, you can see that the observational reality is what we actually see with our eyes. But the subjective reality is a meaning that's attached to that reality. And then the epistemology is how can we know? In other words, how are we going to go about determining what what the reality is, the observational as well as the subjective reality. And there comes in the different methods that we are going to use. Keep this in mind because you will cross reference in your mind between these different slides. And then very important, from where can we know? In other words, what are we going to do with this research? Are we going to explore? In other words, it's a new field. I'm taking again the example of the police officials. Uh, and their meaning making of the policing during COVID protocols. Uh, we have never had a situation like that. So that will be an exploration. An evaluation will be how was it before the, uh, uh, the, the uh, COVID pandemic and how is it now that all the regulations have been lifted? You can see how you evaluate them and then obviously analysis also. 
I would like to speak a little bit about, actually not a little bit, a, a lot about transformative approach that's needed in all four of the worldviews. Now, I must advise you that uh, there's also not, not much agreement about what transformative means. It's a relative new concept. And you will find in the uh, reference list, I've cited uh, a paper that was presented on Wednesday at the Crim Psychologium. Uh, an excellent paper. Uh, you can try to trace it and, and find it there on the transformative, he said, the transformative worldview. So you can see how the terms are used interchangeably. But for me, it's more the transformative approach needed in all four worldviews. Let us unpack transformative. You know, in South Africa, the buzzword, or one of the buzzwords is transformation. We need transformation so badly in our country and on so many different levels. And we also need it in uh, the way in which we conduct our research. And later on, you will start to understand when I discuss the, the Sun Code of Ethics with you, you're going to understand what I mean by transformative. So I hope I'm not going to overload you with all the information, but try to keep up and try to go back to the presentation once you've listened to this, once you've read through all the slides, go back and think about this. Now, I would like to focus on the transformative approach needed in all four worldviews. So for me, it's an overarching, an overarching uh, aspect. The conventional approaches that I grew up in is that you move into the uh, field, you conduct a research, you take out what you what you need and want and you move out and that's it. There is at the moment, um, this is the process question because it says actually the research is exploiting the population and the sample uh, because it, it takes what it wants, the, or the researcher takes what, what, what he or she wants and then we hear nothing, we don't see any of the benefits, uh, we gave our time, we gave our knowledge, and now what? It will be, and I'm going to go back to my example, uh, let's say there's a, a neighborhood where there's an increase in, in housebreaking. The researcher comes in and collects all the data and says, oh, I'm going to write a, a master's degree or a, a thesis, uh, and that's where I will use the data. But the researchers never come back to say, these are my findings. These are the things that I saw that are shortcomings. Pay attention to this. Uh, consider that. Because in every uh, uh, postgraduate uh, delivery, there is a set of recommendations. So you can see how it's questioned. Why must I spend my time? But I'm getting nothing back for it. And people don't want monetary value. Uh, they want information. Uh, uh, the, for the conventional approaches used sometimes viewed as ex, ex, as exploitive, and specifically where in, indigenous communities are involved with. Again, I'm going to talk about this and illustrate to you in the Sun Code of Ethics uh, what they did to counteract this specific point. The researcher's identity need to be negotiated with the community in which the research will be conducted, so as not to impose qualifications and expertise. If you walk into a community, let's say you're investigating or you're researching uh, 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 cr cr crimes on farms, you come in your city car there on, you are nicely dressed and you say, here I am, I want to interview the farmer, I want to interview the farm workers, so that we can see how can we mitigate the problem of stock theft and even farm murder and so forth. And they coming from the work field, they feel intimidated. This is this professor coming in and I'm just a regular farm worker. Uh, so it's very important that the identity must be negotiated from an outsider identity to change to a partnership identity. In other words, to say, let us look at this situation, let us analyze this and come up with solutions and even um, consult in, in the analysis of the data, we in any case call that members, membership checking, 
for the researcher to go back to that farm and say, this is what you gave me, this is how I analyzed it. Was I correct? Did I hear you correctly? Uh, did I say what you wanted to say? And then they can say, sort of, but uh, this is actually what we meant. You can see then it becomes a negotiated identity and it's a partnership. Then the uh, participants to the research also take ownership of the uh, of the data and they basically assist in inverted commas to analyze the data to make sure that that data is reflecting what they said and what they meant to conclude in this discussion research must be a collaborative relationship enterprise it should not be a one-way street very much a collaborative relationship and then even the researcher can engage on a longer term basis and uh, do action research. Action research means you uh, collect data, you analyze, you implement. In a year's time, you come back, you again uh, uh, collect data, uh, you analyze and you act, and then you see, but the intervention that I suggested is working, uh, but let's tweak it a little bit. So it can be a longitudinal relationship also. And that's the best way to go about because then the researcher doesn't just take and, and run for the door, but comes back and says, this is what I found. This is how I can help you. And that is what, what we should do. You, 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 I think you get the sense of uh, the respect uh, that, that, we talk, that we're going to talk about later, respect between researcher and the research site. And uh, the, the, it's sorting your own mind out what you understand it to be. The second aspect that I would like to talk about is the conflation in terminology use. Um, I think some of us as researchers, I'm not saying you, some of us as researchers are getting sometimes a little bit lazy. <laughs> um, we name the same thing this, or different things the same way and uh, it should not be you can have different terms for uh, naming for the world view and so forth but there are a tendency and i pick that up uh, in the proposals that i read uh, for the uh, ethical clearance that res uh, the students and they also the supervisors allow the students to call everything a method everything is not a method there are methods, but everything is not the method. For example, there is a tendency, and I'm now talking from uh, the work that Johann, uh, Professor Johann Matton did, and uh, I've also cited his, the source in, in the reference list. Now, Professor Matton is a formidable researcher in, uh, and he's conducting extensive training, also international, on research methodology. And these points I, I obtained from, from his, uh, the workshop that I attended, that he facilitated. Uh, very often when uh, students talk about the research design, they call it the method of the study. They say the case study is a method or my method is going to be a survey. It's not so. Uh, it's a design. I'm going to unpack what research design means. Very often students uh, also say my method is going to be quantitative or I'm going to be qualitative. My method is qualitative or my method is participant uh, observation. That is not so. Methodology is, is something very different. Uh, I'm going to unpack also for you from the origin of the word methodology, what methodology is. It's not a method, although it says methodology. Methodology refers to something else, and I'm going to give you a big surprise to see where this word comes from. And then there are methods, quite rightly so. Methods are the sampling, the data collection, and the analysis. And within me uh, methods, you've got techniques. I didn't write it down here, but you've got different techniques of sampling. You've got different techniques of data collection and of data analysis. So be very aware that you don't just take a brush, put it in yellow paint and brush everything bright yellow by calling everything method. 
there is no, everything is not method. The only methods are the, are the first, is the first, third point. That's sampling method, data collection method, data analysis method. I hope I make sense up to this point. OK, let's jump into research design meaning. This refers to the type of study. You can see it's far away from a method. The type of study that, that you will conduct. The type of study you will conduct uh, can be the survey, can be eva evaluation studies, explorative studies. I mean, that's just a few. Uh, you, you know what you are busy with and the, there's a variety uh, very much. It's not defined by the differences in methodology, but in their design and their reasoning. And I wish I can go more into the reasoning, but I think that is something for another uh, discussion. Uh, the design. So you will find in both uh, uh, evaluation studies and explorative studies that you will use interviews or you will do observation. But in essence, the one is very different from the other because of the design as well as the reasoning behind it. Now, methodology meaning is very interesting. If you could just give me one moment, I just want to take a sip of water. <clears throat> methodology comes from the Greek word meta, hodos, logos. Now, meta means the larger view, the bigger view. When you say I've got a meta view or meta approach, it means it's very broad. Hodos means road. It's a Greek word for road. And logos means the logic. In other words, meta, hodos, logos, which we say in English methodology. Can you can you hear this? It's it's not method. Methodology, it looks like method the study of the method. It's not so. Um, meta means the end of the road, my destination, where I would like to go to. Hodos, what road am I going to take to get to that point? And logos, uh, the logic that underpins the way in which I will travel that road. So I hope you will never ever think again that methodology means the study of the methods. It is the road that I will take in order to get to that destination. Yes, methods come in there, but it's not purely just methods. Just on this point, for interest's sake, uh, I'm fascinated by the origin of words, and I hope you also can become curious about where words come from. Uh, I had uh, last year to uh, make a, a present a discussion on different educational streams and so forth. And I was wondering, where does the word, what does education mean? Now, I don't know if you know, but education comes from the Greek word education, spelled exactly the same. So we are using Greek words in our English language that still have the same meaning. So we must go back and look at what, what these words mean. It's very quick with uh, uh, Google these days, very quick. What is the Greek meaning of methodology? And you will find this. So go and look a bit deeper into what you are busy with. Um, thirdly, uh, methodology is the researcher's choice of the broad approach to conduct the research. And here comes in, there are in social sciences, three met methodological roads. They can be used in the single context or they can be used combined. The first one is that of quantitative. Think back now to, I think it was the second slide where we talk, talk, spoke about post-positivism. This is it, quantitative outsider. As you know already, but just to put everyone on the same page, the researchers, sits, or the researchers sit in their offices. They construct uh, a questionnaire and they collect the data uh, remotely. They can do telephonic interviews, they can distribute it via the email, they can uh, drop it off at uh, individuals' homes, and then they go and collect it again. There's very little interaction between the researchers and the respondents, because in quantitative, we speak about respondents. Qualitative, we speak about participants. So the uh, uh, researchers always stay outsiders. They do not engage. Uh, 
For example, uh, one of the biggest uh, best examples of quantitative study is that of the national survey that was conducted uh, earlier this year. They ask us many things, many different things. How many fridges we have? How many children we have? What's the age of the people living in the house and so forth? They didn't come in to check and to speak with you and to ask how you feel. No, they wanted certain facts and then they analyzed it and we very eagerly look forward to the results because it gives us wonderful results. Now, the qualitative methodology is that of insider. The qualitative uh, 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 researchers become part of the uh, of, of the study and when we're going to discuss bracketing uh, at the end you're going to remember what I'm uh, what I'm saying here because in qualitative uh, methodology the researchers are the ones that collect the data they're the ones that go and conduct the interviews or physically go and observe certain behavior uh, and then engage for at least an hour sometimes even more with the uh, participants. So they become insiders. That's why it's so important the transformative approach that you be accepted uh, by the uh, by the participant. So the participant trusts you and give you the information that you want and don't just give you any odd information like in quantitative. They can ask how many children do you have and you can say I've got three or you can say I've got five but no one's really checking. Uh, um, but yeah, it is really a relationship so that you are quite aware of what the person and how the person says to you what he or she says. And then obviously participant, that will be agent of change. Uh, uh, that, that will be very much more the, the uh, advocacy uh, design, the uh, worldview, sorry, the uh, advocacy worldview. We become an active participant in the, the, the context uh, and become an agent of, of change. So that is methodology. Now we come to methods. What, is the, what does methods mean? Methods are research task specific choices. Now we come here into the hard stuff. The, um, how am I going to select the participants or respondents? First, obviously, what who is my uh, population? And then how am I going to select the participants or the respondents? Am I going to use probability sampling or non-probability sampling? And you know, within probability sampling, you've got a range of sampling techniques. Are you going to use simple random? Are you going to uh, uh, use... Uh, uh, Oh, there, 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 are, there are many, uh, there are many that, that you can use. And non-probability sampling, are you going to use judgmental sampling, volunteer, uh, um, of the, the of variance of, of, of choice of maximum, minimum variance? So there are many techniques within this, uh, this methods of selection. Also, we move then to methods of measurement. In other words, how will I measure my data? In a quantitative study, I may decide uh, what scaled items will I use? Will I use a Likert scale? Uh, will I use agree, uh, absolutely agree, or I do not agree at all? You know, that scale from one to five or one to ten that you choose. Observation categories in qualitative studies, exactly the same. What am I going to observe? How will my interview schedule, which is now the technique, how will that look? Am I going to look at the birds that fly past while, while the police is um, conducting a, a search uh, operation in a, an open piece of, of, of felt? No, you're not going to be interested in that. You're going to be interested in very specific categories of what you want to go and observe. Then up, up, obviously the next one, methods of data collection. The interviews, the questionnaire, what type of interviews will I use? What type of questionnaires will I use? So there are also choices to be made. Techniques within the methods. And methods of data analysis. I think you already get my drift here. Uh, quantitative statistical methods or thematical, uh, thematic spiral methods. And there are many, many more. I didn't want to give you a shopping list of, of those. You already know that. So can you understand why it's so important to name aspects correctly. If you talk about methods, you talk about how you will select, measure, collect and analyze. 
It's not whether you're going to do a quantitative or a qualitative approach. That is just not correct. So take a, make a little bit of effort and make sure with a fine tooth comb that you name aspects correctly. You must remember that your uh, eventual dissertation thesis will be on UNISA's um, institutional repository and it will be accessible to persons all over the world. So that means you'll have to pretty much speak the right language. Uh, just very briefly, I see I've got about 20 minutes left. Uh, the research design, uh, oh yes, here I quote Maton, research design, which is the logic of the study, is about what constitutes the appropriate evidence in addressing my research questions. Research methodology is about how that will produce the most objective or credible evidence in the study. I would like now to move to the section in research that I personally enjoy very much. Uh, I think research ethics, I'm going to want to share some uh, aspects with you and examples. Uh, I'm not going to read this. You can read this yourself. I took this from the UNISA policy on academic integrity. Uh, which is why UNISA and all universities uh, play and should place a lot of emphasis on, on research ethics because you, the university's reputation is at stake. If you can recall the uh, study that was published about three, four years ago from researchers from Stellenbosch University, where they uh, made the statements, uh, racial statements about certain groups' cognitive abilities where they said that one group is lesser cognitive than the other groups. Now that is just so unethical. You cannot do that. Uh, of, of, so that is, and, and then the Stellenbosch University, which is a major research university, learned a couple of very hard lessons and it was painful. They were painful lessons. So that is why UNISA says there must be rigor in research ethics. So when your supervisor says to you, a complete the application form for ethical clearance. It's with a specific purpose. And that is why we who serve on the ethical clearance committees go through those forms in great detail because we are the buffer. If we let something slip through that eventually damages UNISA's reputation, then it's us that will be on the line, we as reviewers. Good, uh, ethical dimension of the research study. Ethics derives from the Greek word ethos, meaning character. Now, very often students write when they talk about the research ethics, it's to do what is right and not to do what is wrong. That is not really so. That's in any case a given. You must in any case do the, do the right thing. Research ethics actually refers to the researcher's approach, methodology and interpretation of the findings and results. That must be of such a nature that it shows respect for the rights of the human participants from where the data is collected. So it's the approach of the researcher. And if the approach of the researcher is ethical, then everything that that researcher will do will be ethical. Pertinent issues from the policy, uh, that's actually from the UNISA research uh, uh, ethics policy. The issue of plagiarism. I'm not going to discuss that in detail with you. I'm sure everyone is aware of that and how that is a poison that a student can drink uh, to think that he or she will get away with plagiarism. Not just what Turnitin will, will show. Uh, and Turnitin shows many things, but uh, uh, plagiarism is a crime. Cheating, <laughs> that's just plain, plain dishonest. Um, and eventually it's egg on the face of the person that cheats or the one that falsifies. Um, you will recall many, many prominent, very prominent uh, 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 principles of universities. There was recently one at Zululand, I think three, four years ago, where they found out that he copied a, a, a thesis from somewhere in America and changed the front page and put his name and he was found out. Uh, and it's more than egg, egg on the face. A prominent politician uh, recently, uh, not recently, also a couple of years ago, said he was doctor. Dr. Jordan. And then they realized, but he, he hasn't got a doctorate, but it was nice to be called doctor. Or is it, if you know that 
this work that everyone is so proud of and give you credit for and you get capped for is actually falsification. Fabrication uh, is the intentional invention of, in, of facts, results or other information. And I just would like to uh, end this, this specific point to say that if it's found that the student's work has been uh, that has cheated, falsified, fabricated, uh, that it's as much the supervisor that's on the line than what it is a student. And uh, uh, there can be severe re repercussions. So don't ever complain, oh, but the form for the ethical clearance is so much work to complete. It's not. Uh, just do it. Okay, now I would like to come to the codes of ethics. There are many different codes of ethics. Obviously, you have to consult the Euronista uh, policy on research ethics. That's a given. But uh, specifically on a doctoral level, but I encourage my master's level students to already look wider. Uh, the UNESCO research code uh, is um, a, 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 an absolute must have uh, code to, to consider. Uh, I've actually put the, uh, the URL here. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but I think I'm sort of running out of time, so I wouldn't like to go into that in detail. You know that UNESCO is the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Uh, and they are like the uh, big brother of, of code of ethics. There are many other codes of ethics, for example, uh, the Belmont Report, the Singapore, Singapore Protocol. Um, the co code is always named at the city where it was formulated. Very soon you will have the Cape Town uh, I don't know if they, whether they're going to call it protocol or, or, or approach, whatever, because there was recently in May uh, a major international conference in Cape Town to review every how many years uh, the international community come together and look at the code of ethics and then tweak and refine it uh, in order to, to make it as fresh and as relevant to the day. But I would like to focus on the sun, sun code of ethics. But let me just very briefly, uh, 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 please try to Google this also, although it is embedded in this presentation. I don't know why it doesn't want to open now. The sun code of research ethics uh, is from the sun people in the Northern Cape. Um, this was coined in 2017. And um, Andres Steenkamp, the leader of the sun community at that stage, was heavily involved in the sun code of ethics because they realized that they were being terribly exploited uh, by researchers in the sense, uh, and it was specifically a German group of scientists that came to them and they actually uh, uh, interrogated the Sun people. They made them feel as though, because they didn't, don't, didn't understand all the scientific language, uh, that they were like not in the intelligence side so strong. Uh, they were like talking down to them and they took samples of plants and they took it back to Europe and they developed it into absolutely groundbreaking uh, diet medicine. Because as you know, the sun used some plants uh, when they go for weeks sometimes without water, without food, to suppress their hunger and their thirst. And um, but that's indigenous knowledge. And these people came and they exploited them. They made millions and millions of euros from from uh, th this sun knowledge that they that they exploited and they gave nothing back. So uh, Andre Steenkamp decided this is not it. Uh, uh, we're not going to allow it. So anyone that wants any information from them must sign the sun code of research ethics. It's all about respect. It's all about trans transformation. And just for interest's sake, um, unfortunately, Andre Steenkamp has passed away already, but he left a legacy and he said, you're welcome, come and do research, but come in through the door, don't come in through the window. Can you hear? Be honest in what you do. Don't just take, give back. Okay, the principles of research ethics, that is of benefence and non non, non sense. Do good, and do not do harm. Inform consent. Ensure that consent is informed. Don't think that if you ask someone, 
will you participate in my research? And the person says, yes, yes, I'll do it. But he doesn't know what he's consenting to. Doesn't really know, especially in rural areas, in uh, disadvantaged com communities, they don't really know what research is. So it must be informed consent. It must be in the language that they understand it. It must be explained to them. They must not be uh, put on the impression that they will get money for, for uh, granting the interview or whatever. Obviously, important anonymity and confidentiality is also very important in the sense that the, the details of the participants must be um, must be protected uh, so that there is no chance that uh, the, the identity of the participants can be uh, identified. Let me give you an example. I recently uh, uh, completed a, 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 a PhD uh, of a student in Zimbabwe uh, and he uh, wanted to, uh, he did a narrative study, fascinating, on reasons why uh, there is such a low reportage rate uh, of rape and there's a very high rape uh, figure in that area. Um, it's a very disadvantaged community. Uh, it's 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 desperately poor, uh, very low education. And uh, then we encountered an unethical problem, discussed it with Dr. Fisaghi, the head of research integrity at UNISA. And she said, but what you think your problem is, is not your problem. You've got another problem. You cannot, because he named the village the villages, a group of villages where he would collect the data from. She said that it can be directly related to whom he spoke to because there's the, the head of the village, there's the uh, uh, teachers in the village and so forth. So we had to change the title of the study to indicate the region and not the, the, uh, the, the, the villages themselves. Can you see how anonymity cuts much deeper than just to say Oh, I'm going to give the participant a code, or I'm going to use a pseudonym. Um, think very clearly, clearly about anonymity and confidentiality. Obviously, voluntary participation. Uh, some researchers halfway in the interview, when the participant says, you know, I feel uncomfortable, I, I don't want to continue, uh, would then have to say, you it's fine if you leave, it's fine. There's no consequences. I, I would like you to, to complete, but it's fine. Voluntary participation is what it's all about. So you can see the principles of research ethics, very, very important. Now, the last aspect that I would like to speak about is bracketing. I find that very few students in the School of Criminal Justice bracket themselves. What does bracketing mean? Bracketing in French is called epoch. So if you come upon that word, it's very often used in, in methodology books, know what, what it means. Um, because a researcher is an instrument of data collection and data analysis, it's important to say, what do I bring to this study? Am I called from the outside? Or am I bringing experience, knowledge to this study? Uh, in my early days of uh, learning about methodology, uh, uh, it was actually a very interesting session on, on, on phenomenology. Phenomenology is where you go into deep uh, meaning making. As I said, of, uh, police officials, meaning that they made of the way in which they had to police during the pandemic. And uh, you've, that you've got to then say, or the person that actually did the training, said that she did a doctorate on the meaning that parents attach meaning making to the fact that they lost their children, that their children passed away as young children. And she as researcher was interested in that topic because she also lost two of her children at a young, young age. So you can see if she conducts a study, it will be much deeper, much warmer, much richer than what I, who never had children in my whole life, would have if I had to go and do that study. And it's important to, uh, to uh, release that information, to, to make it known to the readers what the involvement of the, of the researcher is in the topic. Let me give you an, another example. I had a doctorate student who did his research on a very, very difficult topic, uh, emotionally difficult. It was uh, uh, human trafficking in 
persons for sexual exploitation. Um, uh, he was a police official for many years and he specialized in human trafficking. Uh, the, the investigation thereof. He also had many successes uh, in court. He had to go and testify in court uh, because he he just had to. This was his passion to to prevent this this terrible type of crime. But he was also a very deeply religious person, and he felt that the name and that by that I'm not saying traffic victims for sexual exploitation are prostitutes, but they are prostitutes and then there are the victims. And he preferred to do the, use the word prostitute and not sex worker, because the convention is to use the word sex worker these days. But he, through his religion, he was motivating why he's going to call them prostitutes. Can you see how the black bracketing was absolutely necessary? Otherwise, the examiners would have said, you know, change all these terms to sex worker. And uh, not one of the three examiners asked that because he bracketed himself. He said, this is why I use that specific term and why I don't use the other term. Um, obviously, there are different ways to bracket. The one can be through a reflexive journal to uh, map out one's experiences uh, from the emotions from you start until you finish. Or it can be, and I personally prefer a direct statement of past experience linked to the research topic. Um, let me give you an example. I've got at the moment a student uh, who's doing a mixed method study doctorate uh, on um, why the 10111 centers in the, in the police are not functioning as optimally as they should. And he started off his career in the police working at one of the the one a triple one centers and obviously th uh, things have changed now tremendously but he knew what they are going through what it means to sit and answer those phones and many of those phones are hoax calls or people that just shout how bad and poor the police is instead of wanting to help and to send out uh, a, a vehicle to go and assist at the scene of crime uh, so you can see he, his study is going to be much deeper than me, who's never worked in, a, I've never been in the police, uh, would, would be. So he brings a lot of knowledge, a lot of insight. That's why bracketing is so important. And if you haven't got experience in that topic of your research, then at least motivate why you are interested in that topic. Why did you choose that topic and not another, another topic? Okay, that is my presentation. I would like to point you to the uh, sources consulted. Uh, in a number of them that I include the URL, uh, you'll see the sources that I used. Uh, I can also, in terms of transformative uh, design, refer you to the uh, excellent book by Professor Nina Rom from UNISA. Um, and there's also the Sun Research Institute, the code, as well as the two at least must have uh, topics. Okay, thank you very much for listening to me. I think I've exceeded my time. Apologies for that. Um, you've been very patient with me. Uh, yeah, I think you can hear I'm very passionate about methodology, especially about the ethics. Thank you. And I wish you everything of the best on your studies further. And for those of you who are, are supervising the students, uh, it's also a great privilege. <laughs>